tribal trails, tribal trails. The Son of God, He is near. He chose to walk with us. These tribal trails. Tribal trails. The God of the Bible knows everything. Whether we believe him or not, he knows every single detail of our lives. Elihu in the Old Testament talked about that. He said, For God watches how people live. He sees everything that they do. No darkness is thick enough to hide the wicked from his eyes. We don't set the time when we will come before God in judgment. In short, God is in control. We need to be ready for the judgment call. I'm glad that you've joined us on Tribal Trails to hear how the Lord worked in the life of our guest, Becky Q, and made her ready to meet him. Becky was raised in Kelleher, Saskatchewan. To begin with, she describes the spiritual condition of her growing up years. I grew up in a town where there wasn't um, a lot of believers that I knew of. I didn't even know what a Christian was. Um, everybody was very busy with various things. And one of the things that I was busy with as a young person is wanting to drink and have fun. Um, but what happened when I was, before I graduated from high school, uh, a family moved into our hometown and they were different. Um, they didn't drink, they didn't smoke, they didn't fight, they didn't swear at each other. And I watched them and I hung out with their kids. And I actually ended up, um, they went to youth group and they took me to their youth group. There wasn't really any place to go and kill her, but we traveled and we went to a youth group. And one time they took me to a movie in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, and it was called Cry from the Mountain. And at the end of the movie, Billy Graham came on the screen and he asked if people wanted to turn to the Lord. Um, they can come walk up the aisle and do that. And I wanted what my friends had because I saw that they were different. But um, I didn't understand that I was a sinner. I didn't understand that my sin separated me from God. Um, but I knew that I was empty in my heart. And I walked the aisle, and I can still remember this to this day. Um, I met a little old lady. Her name was Marilyn Anaka. And if she's watching, that would be wonderful. And she showed me John 3.16. And when she read that verse... Um, she put my name in the verse. And after she read the verse to me, she prayed with me. And she told me I was a Christian. And see, I wanted the blessings of God. I wanted to be free in my heart. I wanted to be free to live right. I wanted peace with God. I, I wanted to know that I was loved and accepted. But I, wasn't, I didn't know I was a sinner, and I wasn't willing to turn from my sin. So my life didn't change, even though I was told I was a Christian. And I know she would have been praying for me, and she sent me letters every month after that. She, she did all that God was required of her to do. But salvation is between me and God. And um, I never really turned from my sin until three years later in my apartment building when I hit rock bottom from drinking and being lonely and trying to fill my life up with everything else but having a relationship with God. Jesus said, For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And I got a John 316 poster in my um, apartment building um, in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And I read the verse and it spoke to me, and I got in touch with a man who was doing evangelism work in Saskatoon. And um, he asked me if I was a Christian, and I said, yeah, sure, I'm a Christian, but I wasn't. And I was actually living in sin, drinking, partying, and doing all those kind of things that young people do. I was going to do post-secondary education. And um, I started visiting with him, and uh, eventually I found out that I was far away from the Lord, and I needed him. And um, I was lonely, and I wanted to be loved, and when I heard about God's love, he captured my heart, and uh, I can remember being by myself in my apartment building, no money, spending all my student loan money on drinking, and partying all the time, and just hitting rock bottom and saying, God, I am so sorry for this and for that and for this and for that. And my sins never bothered me before, 
But at that moment, I realized that I was guilty before God for so many things. And then I got really scared because I couldn't remember all my sins. And for the first time in my life, I admitted to God that I was a sinner. And I called on Him to come into my heart and to come into my life, take away my sins and, uh, and be Lord. And that night, my friends asked me to go to the bar to go drinking. And for the first time ever, I said no. Couldn't do that before. So, yeah. So that was the beginning of a new life over 21 years ago. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that Becky has made a life-changing decision. However, a lot of people don't take time to evaluate the way they are living their lives. They have no sense of accountability. Some of them even believe there is a God and think, God is love. Why should I worry about things like judgment? Those people feel that God is so loving that he won't judge them for not living by his truth. Therefore, they live with little or no thought about how God might view their actions. Is God love and nothing else? No, God is more than love. Let us take a look at Deuteronomy 7. The overall message of the chapter shows the two sides of God's character. First, God is love. He is eager to bless his people and to help those who trust in him. Second, God is holy. Our disobedience can provoke his anger. In Deuteronomy 7 verse 10, Moses alerted the Israelites to be on the lookout for a good God who does not hesitate to punish and to destroy those who reject him. God's anger is just. It should motivate us to think soberly about our relationship with Him. A right relationship comes only when we believe in Christ and our sins are forgiven. According to Romans 8.1, there is no condemnation for those who have taken the step of faith, but for those who have never turned to Christ, there is plenty to worry about. What the Bible tells us about God's anger is not meant to drive us away from Him. Rather, it is meant to draw us to His love. That's good news. So would you take the step of faith today? You might feel the need of talking to someone before you decide to follow Christ. Call us. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell it goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell the guilty pair bowed down with care god sent his son to us his every child he reconciled to pardon from our sins oh love of god how rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song skies of parchment made were every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole Though stretch from sky to sky Oh, love of God, how rich and pure How measureless and strong It shall forevermore endure The saints and angels song Oh, love of God, how rich and how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the 
saints an angel's song. The saints an angel's song. How did you get involved with uh, um, the Native Ministries? I had early childhood education degree, and uh, after I became a Christian, the Lord opened up so many doors for me, and He gave me work uh, in daycares. And as I worked in the daycare system for about eight years, um, I noticed that there was a lot of single moms, um, Aboriginal moms, coming in with their kids and needing care, and a lot of them were on their own. And my heart went out to them. And as I worked with these kids, I felt really frustrated on the inside because here I was teaching them to try and do what was right, but they didn't have the power to do it. And I knew in my heart they needed the Lord, but I wasn't free to share with them about Jesus in the daycare. So eventually after um, some time of struggle and praying and, and uh, letting God work on my heart, he eventually opened up the door for me to begin work in my own hometown visiting with um, women, single women, Aboriginal women in low income housing areas and, and different places in Port La Prairie, Manitoba. Eventually I began visiting these people on weekends, these ladies, and, and getting to know them, having coffee with them, going to their homes. And eventually I was able to let go of my work little by little and cut down my hours so that I can spend more time with them and minister to them and share the gospel with them. And God just kind of opened the door for me to do full-time work. <clears throat> so uh, how does that work? Yeah, and I wondered that too. And I actually wrestled with, with God about that. I thought, God, how can you be calling me to serve you in full-time work? And I don't have money. I don't have, I don't have anything. How am I going to do it? But God wanted my heart. And, and if you give him your heart and if you're willing, he's going to work out the rest. Because God won't send us somewhere to do something without meeting our needs. He promises that. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And he kept giving me that verse over and over again um, from the Bible, Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And it would come to me several times um, throughout the week. A lady would give me a verse, and that verse would be inside her bi in the book that she gave me. Or I'd see it on a devotional calendar, or someone would be preaching about it. And it was like God was telling me, just believe me. I'm sending you out to go minister to these people. And just believe me, and I'll take care of the rest. And, and that's what happened. I ended up actually locking myself in my uh, bedroom for about a week, making sure that I wanted to be in God's will. Because I didn't want to step out in faith doing this without for sure having his confirmation, without having his blessing in it. And he showed it to me and he gave me peace about it. And um, by that time I was only working 6.30 to 9 in the morning, opening up a daycare and then at 9 I was done and I had the rest of the day and I was busy and I took that final step and said, I, I know I, the Lord want, set me apart to serve him full time and I left that job totally. And as Christians and believers heard about the work that I was doing, they began to support it. The Apostle Paul said to the believers in Philippi, And this same God, who takes care of me, will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. A couple from my church heard about um, my desire to uh, serve the Lord in, in this way. I couldn't keep an apartment building anymore, so they actually um, built a room in their basement for me to stay in and put up walls and gave me a little room and I stayed with them for about three years and learning from the Lord, walking with God and serving in the gospel, running a soup kitchen, having Bible studies, um, having children's work. And God was blessing in many ways, but one of the ways he blessed was through finances so that I could eventually, after three years, uh, get an apartment building on my own. And you know, it's been almost 10 years, I now have my own house in Amaranth, Manitoba. And so, you honor God in little things, take little steps, and he'll, he'll meet your need and, and, and bless and uh, give you more responsibility. Do you uh, work through a church or an organization? Well, that's, that's another good question. Um, I basically, uh, I joined, I've joined forces with many Aboriginal organizations. 
MSC services would be, Missionary Services Canada would be a place that I'm affiliated with and they would um, uh, direct the funds to me. So, um, but I also work with, say, um, Indian Life newspaper uh, and I would write an article for them and I would distribute their, their newspaper and the things that they would distribute from the catalog, I would uh, send those things out to people freely. Um, I work with Seed Sowers, um, that's another Christian organization that distributes the Word of God freely. Um, Via Magazine is another uh, gospel magazine that you can find on the internet that I would distribute. So um, my work, uh, I'm kind of like a vessel and I, I use your DVDs from Travel Trails to send out to people. So uh, how did you get involved with Indian Life? Actually, this is when I first started in the work. Um, I didn't even have my own vehicle because I had to give that up too and I was riding a bus everywhere. And I'm from Saskatchewan, but God sent me to Manitoba. So what I was doing was taking a bus from Manitoba to come home to visit my family. And the bus stopped in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, and there's a bookstore there. And during that time in my life, I was really enthralled with um, a couple that I'd been reading about called, Mar they were called Marcus and Narcissa Whitman. The Whitmans, they were the first couple to cross the Great Divide and bring the gospel to the Nez Perce Indians. And um, so I was trying to read as much as I can about Marcus Whitman. And when my bus stopped in Yorkton, I jumped over to the Christian bookstore because I wanted to find out about Marcus Whitman. And I was looking through all the books. And as I looked, I was thumbing through the books. And then I saw this one book on the side. It said Whitman's Gospel. But really, the book was called White Man's Gospel. And I picked the book up looking to read about Marcus Whitman. But really, it was a book by Craig Smith put out through Indian Life Ministries. And as I went through the book, and then I read about Indian Life Ministries in the back of the book, I'm thinking, this is an organization I need to get in touch with. And, uh, and that's when I found out about the newspaper and the, and the catalog of materials that they, that they um, uh, provide for people at, uh, in terms of Christian ministry and gospel literature. And I eventually got in touch with them and, and started distributing their paper and eventually became a columnist for the paper. So I have an article in the back of uh, that paper, and it comes out every two months. Every day they pass me by I can see it in their eyes Empty people filled with care Headed who knows where On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries, only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. So uh, how did you get involved in the, the, uh, the, the reserve? I was living in Porge La Prairie and I was working, uh, taking literature to Long Plain Reserve, Dakota Teepee Reserve, Dakota Plains Reserve and I started hearing over the radio about Sandy Bay and about the, the um, suicides that were happening and it really touched my heart that 14 year old people were taking their lives and I would hear about it a lot. And it was like God was speaking to me to um, get in touch with Sandy Bay. And I did. I phoned the school and I talked to a lady by the name of Shirley Roulette, a good friend of mine. And um, she was the principal at the time. And I asked her if I can come and share um, with the youth, with the kids of that community about how there's hope and that 
suicide isn't the answer. And I shared with them my own story about how God worked in my life and changed me and gave me hope. After that, the teachers really, really um, liked what they heard and um, they invited me to come back and I did. And, uh, and then I went, drove back and forth for a whole year from Portage to Sandy Bay, going to the school. And um, eventually I started praying about a house to live there. There's not much housing out there and God opened up the door for me to find a, a home to rent. And then I moved out there. And uh, since that time, it's been eight years, it'll be eight years. Um, this school year, I've been working at Sandy Bay, also running a drop-in center for the kids so that they have a safe place to go to and play ping pong and foosball. And they hang out there and we have treats and snacks and, and we visit. And I also run a camp out there every year. This past summer was my sixth year having a camp there called Bibleicious Camp. How did that start? Well, um, I would hear from the teachers and parents that there wasn't lots for the kids to do in the summertime because um, hockey's done and the kids love hockey but they don't skate all through the summer as much as they would love to and there is some baseball happening and things like that but I just thought it would be really neat to have a camp a day camp for the kids so that they could um, hear the word of God sing do crafts and have um, a place to go and, and, and be busy and it goes from 1 to 7 30 every day it's free god provides for the camp we don't charge anybody a dime they eat good meals chili and bannock and buns and fruit and muffins and and all kinds of things and they go swimming and uh, and we play sports and this past year we had uh, almost 100 kids go through so it's been good we are called to take his life to a world where wrong, wrong seems right. What could be too great a cause for sharing life with one who's lost? Through his love our hearts can feel all the grief they hear the words of life only we can share people need the Lord people need the Lord at the end of broken dreams he's the open door people need the Lord people need the Lord when will we realize that we must give our love need the Lord. People need the Lord. You uh, work with women in uh, prisons? Uh, the Lord's opened up the door for me to share the gospel in prisons. Um, I haven't done a lot like what I used to when I was in Portage. I used to go to the Portage Women's Jail there. In the past few years, I've been at MYC working with um, youth there and visiting and having a gospel meeting. But this past, uh, in the last two weeks, I got a message from on Facebook from someone who works at the penitentiary in Headingley, the women's penitentiary. And they were um, working on a date to bring me out there to speak to the women. I love working with women because um, I find Aboriginal women especially, they don't... Um, they don't have a sense of worth. We don't, we don't value ourselves like we should. Men and children too, all around the world. But I find um, if you don't know your value in God's sight, you're gonna give yourself away to things and to people. And young girls are, are wanting the man of their dreams, but there's a greater and bigger and better love that, that we were created to have in our heart. If God doesn't have first place, there's gonna be hurt and there's gonna be trouble and there's gonna be dysfunction. 
And so when, when women come to know your, their value, that their value um, isn't based on who, whose hand they're holding or um, what kind of runners are, they're wearing or hoodie or what kind of car they're driving, when they learn that their value is based on what Jesus Christ did at the cross, that that establishes their worth, um, it's going to change their life. And so that's my, that's my burden is to share with women and people in general how valuable they are in God's sight. Because when you really, really know that and you really accept what God has done for you, it's going to change your quality of life. And um, you're, you're not going to be a 14-year-old girl giving yourself away and, and becoming pregnant at such a young age. You're going to be interested in keeping yourself pure and bringing glory to God with your life. Thank you, Becky, for sharing your insight with us. How do you feel about yourself today? Do you feel small and insignificant? I'd like to introduce a wise man to you. His name is Agar. In Proverbs 30, Agar showcases insects and other small creatures. He calls them small, but very wise. Look at the ants. They are weak, but their creator has taught them to use whatever strength they have to prepare for the future. Consider the locusts. They have no king, but when their, multi their number multiplies, God has taught them to line up and move in unity. So when you feel small and insignificant, remember that God showcases his wisdom and greatness through even the smallest things. Furthermore, Jesus has something to say about your value in God's sight. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus said to his disciples in verses 29 to 31, What is the price of two sparrows, one copper coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. The Bible also says that people are created in God's image. We are valuable and special in His sight. That's the reason for God to redeem you and me from sin with the life of His Son. So our life comes with a big price tag. It's God's way to say, I love you. Would you accept His love through Jesus Christ? As Becky mentioned earlier, your acceptance of His love would change the quality of your life. So let Jesus make a difference in your life today. If you need assistance, call us. Of all wonders the world has ever known Above all wealth and treasure of the earth There's no way to measure what you're worth Crucified Stone, you live to die, rejected and alone, like a rose trampled on the ground. You took the fall.